friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise and I just work here. Today's is a bit of an unusual video. I promise that title down there is not clickbait. Nor is it a working title for a cartoon series that I'll be pitching to Netflix. Today's video is actually about radioactive science snakes. We will get to the snakes in a minute, I promise, but my homeschooling is about more than just snakes and lizards, so sometimes other stuff has to bleed through on these videos, eh? So stick with me. If you look at the data, nuclear energy is the safest, cleanest, most reliable energy source we have right now. Technologies for sun and wind have come a long way, and in terms of pollution generated while producing power, come pretty close to matching nuclear, but the mining of raw materials, manufacturing, and installation required for solar and wind comes at a steep and often unseen environmental cost. Hopefully we can continue to invest and improve on wind and solar so that they can reign supreme, but for now, nuclear generates less harmful pollution, has a smaller mining footprint, and is far more reliable than wind or solar, and has a minuscule death rate. So if it's so safe, clean and reliable, why do I, like so many, feel uneasy with the thought of nuclear power? Like, I know in my brain that it's safe, but why do I try my best to not think about the fact that I am, right now, at this very second, only a couple hundred kilometers away from six nuclear power plants? Why does nuclear energy scare us? Well, it's probably because despite the infinitesimally small chances of one happening, there is not much that's scarier than a nuclear disaster, right? Maybe a bathtub full of spiders, but that'd be about it for me. The effects of acute radiation poisoning on a living thing are terrifying. And a release of huge doses of ionizing radiation is probably the second worst thing to happen to any environment. I'll share the shocking answer as to what's first at the end of the video. This is why there are countless safety measures and fail safes in place in any nuclear power plant to ensure that that doesn't happen. Corporate greed, corruption, lack of oversight can erode those measures, and propaganda, unflattering portrayal in TV shows. compelling, sensational, but not entirely factual docu-series on Netflix can all lower trust in nuclear power. But when done right, as it is the overwhelming majority of the time, nuclear is safe. But sometimes things still go catastrophically wrong, and when it does, it can infect the entire world. Chernobyl and Fukushima are the worst and most well-known examples of this, and the latter is what relates to our topic today. By the way, those safety figures showing how safe nuclear energy is includes the death toll of these disasters and any other incidents. Nuclear energy is orders of magnitude safer than fossil fuels. On March 11th, 2011, Japan was rocked by the Tohoku earthquake, the largest ever recorded to hit Japan. It triggered an enormous tsunami, 40 meters high in some areas. The quake, tsunami, and subsequent flooding dealt massive damage to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, causing several hydrogen explosions and core meltdowns in multiple reactors, dumping a buttload of radioactive material into the environment and necessitating the evacuation of more than 150,000 people. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm getting to the snakes, I promise. But I need to first put all the bits into context. So really quick, radiation is all around us. Light from the sun, radio, cell phones from space, your TV, light bulbs, oh no, I'm gonna die it because there's light bulbs all around me. It's everywhere and different types have different effects. And when talking about radiation in the context of nuclear power or bombs or radioactive stuff, we're talking about ionizing radiation, like x-rays or gamma rays. Ionizing radiation is not produced by your microwave or 5G cell towers or government mind control rays. Ionizing radiation is radiation that is so energized that it can strip electrons from atoms and molecules, causing them to become ionized. When this type of radiation zips through us or any living thing, it can cause chemical changes in our cells, harming DNA, creating cellular damage, cellular death, organ failure, cancer, just all 
sorts of terrible stuff. Ionizing radiation is very bad, but we are well equipped to handle a little bit of it. There are many sources of ionizing radiation that we encounter on a daily basis. From cosmic rays from space, particles in the soil, smoke detectors to granite countertops. Those minuscule amounts cause very little damage, which our bodies can easily repair. So depending on exposure, the effects of ionizing radiation range from no ill effects at all to ya melting. So monitoring nuclear radiation and where it is after a nuclear accident is incredibly important, and this is where our radioactive science snakes come in. Nuclear contamination is very long lived in contrast to other types of pollutants like oil spills or chemical leaks and is very dangerous. So sending people into exclusion zones for extended stays to take detailed readings is very risky. Comrade soldier, you're done. Robots can do it and they are used occasionally, but they need to be heavily shielded and are expensive. You could also slip in and install passive sensors, but they only measure in the area they are installed. The level of contamination is highly variable. Type of surface, amount of surface area, the way particles collect, all factors in. You might have relatively safe levels here, but 50 meters over there is a really bad day. This means you would need a whole lot of sensors and they still wouldn't provide the complete picture. It's a tricky task, but in a 2020 study, a team from the University of Georgia came up with a novel solution. UGA, by the way, is where my big sister studied and got her undergraduate degree. The campus is gorgeous. Anyway, this team from UGA came up with a plan to use Japanese rat snakes as bioindicators and stand-ins for mobile radiation monitors inside of exclusion zones. Animals as bioindicators is nothing new. I'm sure you've heard of the expression canary in a coal mine. Well, the canary in that situation is a bioindicator. Miners would take a canary down to the coal mines with them. The canary being itty bitty would be more sensitive to toxins in the air. If the canary started freaking out or just dropped dead, they knew there was toxic gas down there even if they couldn't smell it and knew to leave the mine to the mole people. Not a great deal for the bird, but was an effective bioindicator to keep the miners safe. Now the UGA team isn't giving these Japanese rat snakes the canary treatment of tagging along with their people until they die so we know when it's time to skedaddle or by dissecting them to measure the radiation levels present in their tissue. Instead, what they are doing is collecting wild rat snakes, equipping them with tiny radiation decimeters and GPS trackers, and releasing them back into their environment. As they do their thing, scientists are able to collect tons of data about the radiation levels in different areas over time in the exclusion zone. But why settle on snakes? Oh, it's so adorable. But why settle on snakes? It turns out they're perfectly suited for this kind of work. They're small, but relatively long lived amongst comparably sized animals. They're both predator and prey, so they can be useful tracking radiation up and down the food chain. They have a pretty contained home range, but are active within it and can go anywhere cruising on the ground, through leaf litter in the soil itself, through bushes, high in the trees, in sheds, barns, over rocks, through rivers, in forests, grasslands, urban environments. You name it. This is really important because, as I mentioned, radioactive fallout doesn't accumulate evenly. Radioactive particles get blown on the wind and attach themselves to dust, and that dust settles where there's a lot of surface area to cling to. Each of these environmental items or areas in the snake's range all have a differing likelihood of holding onto those contaminants and will have different radiation levels. Over time, the readings that these snakes take creates a very detailed map of the radiation present throughout their range, as well as the correlation between the radiation in the snakes themselves and the radiation in their surroundings, and insight into how specific animals use contaminated landscape, further helping us increase our understanding of the environmental impacts of a disaster like this. Here's how they did it. Scientists identified regions that they wanted to study, then went looking for snakes in those areas, usually by driving down the road and jumping out when they spotted one and grabbing it. If the snake is big enough, they would wrap some special science tape around it, duct tape, it was duct tape, and then super glue the decimeter and GPS tracker to the tape so that they can easily remove it all without harming the snake once the study is done. Then the snakes were returned to where they were caught and let loose to go about their business. 
Periodically, researchers would go into the field and visually locate snakes to record where it was in the trees under a rock whatever, to compare against the readings and understand those relationships. There were nine snakes in all that collected a ton of data that scientists will be analyzing and learning all sorts of valuable information from. Not least of which is the fact that these animals are actually flourishing. You might imagine that a heavily irradiated exclusion zone like Fukushima and Chernobyl to be desolate wastelands, but the opposite is true. While the radiation may be damaging individual animals at the cellular levels, the populations of most of the wildlife in those regions has increased, both in numbers and in diversity, with extant species returning now that we've bugged out. We have a much harder time with radiation than most wildlife. We're relatively big and are more likely to get hit with those wayward particles. We are also long-lived, giving lots of time for those damaged cells and DNA to wreak havoc on our system. The wild is a tough place to be, and most animals meet their end long before the damage from radioactivity becomes an issue. There are, of course, specific instances of radioactive-related abnormalities or birth defects, but overall, once humans left, the wildlife in those areas bounced back to levels of health and biodiversity not seen since we originally showed up and started messing things up. Let that sink in for a minute. Pressures that humans put on the environment is far, far more damaging to it than a nuclear catastrophe. That's why at the top of the video, I said that a nuclear disaster is the second worst thing to happen to any environment. Sadly, just our presence is number one and we need to be better. On that cheery note, let's call it a day. I hope you enjoyed learning a bit about radioactive science snakes. Snakes are vitally important to the world we share and despite the fear and mistrust many have about them, they are so beneficial to us. While the need for their help here comes from a terrible situation, it is another example of how they make great partners. As always, I'd like to extend my thanks to my friends on Patreon. The support I get from you helps my channel and reptiles immensely. My patrons enjoy all sorts of perks from early access to videos, merch discounts, behind the scenes content, and more. If you'd like to lend your support to my channel, check out patreon.com slash Girl. Thanks. If you want to learn more about nuclear energy, what's safe about it, what's not, and fascinating stories about nuclear accidents, history, all that stuff, I highly recommend you check out Kyle Hill on YouTube. He's one of my favorite science communicators on the platform and talks about this stuff a lot. In fact, I first heard about this very topic from Kyle. I doubt he will ever see this, but if he does, Kyle, you rock. Thanks for all that you do. And thanks to all of you for watching. You know the drill. Until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye. Who would have thought? Ionization ionizes something. Who knew? Not me. You know, jokes have to be funny to be a joke, just saying. Yeah, and if you make them excessive, then they aren't. Face it, excessive. At least it's not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was a good one. That was actually pretty good. Thanks. Yeah. No, that was nice. Thank you. I don't think mom's gonna let you put that in the bloopers. It's gonna make it in. Yeah, okay. Be a scar. <laughs>